Hello lovelies. In this video we're going to be going through the sociology of families for your AQA GCSE sociology. Now after you've watched this video, made all the notes, learned all the facts, looked at all the key terms to help you remember all the facts, to help you with your recall, your AO1, so that in the exam you can apply and evaluate at a better level over on the website. After every single section, we've broken it down into smaller videos, there is a set of multiple choice questions to help you recall the facts and then there are going to be the predictive papers and the walkthroughs and the example essays that we've got in our masterclass. AQA GCSE Sociology Topic 3 Families Lesson 1 Sociological Perspectives on the Functions of Families Functionalists The family is a complex social institution that serves a variety of functions, both at the individual and societal level. Sociological perspectives on the functions of families provide different ways of understanding the role and significance of families in society. Let's start with functionalists. Functionalists are focused on the positive contributions the family makes to society. They see the family as a cornerstone to society and argue that without it, society could descend into chaos. The functionalist perspective on families emphasises their role in maintaining social stability and meeting the basic needs of society, seeing families as serving the needs of everyone in society. Functionalists also argue that the nuclear family structure of a married couple and their children is the most efficient and effective way to meet these needs. One of the key functionalist theorists for the family is Murdoch. Murdoch argued some form of the nuclear family existed in most societies, making it universal. He saw the family as having four main functions. Number one, sexual function. Families provide a context for the development of sexual relationships and the formation of intimate partnerships. For example, in many cultures, marriage is viewed as a normative context for sexual activity and the raising of children. Families also play a role in shaping individuals' attitudes and behaviours towards sexuality and reproduction. Number two, reproductive function. Families are responsible for the reproduction and raising of children. They provide a stable environment for the upbringing and socialisation of children. For example, parents are responsible for providing basic needs such as food, clothing and shelter for their children and for ensuring their physical and emotional well-being. Number three, economic function. Families play an important economic role by providing for the basic needs of their members and by participating in the larger economy through work and consumption. For example, parents may work to earn income to support the family, while children may contribute to the family by doing chores or working part-time jobs. Families also provide material goods for the children, e.g. shelter, clothing and food, which children could not buy themselves. Number four, educational function. Families are responsible for the education and socialisation of children, passing on values, beliefs and cultural heritage from one generation to the next. For example, parents may teach their children basic skills such as reading and writing, and they may also introduce them to the customs and traditions of their culture, which helps create a value consensus in society. As families are usually the first people to teach their children, this is known as primary socialisation. A second prominent functionalist theorist is Tolcott Parsons, who emphasises the role of the family in the socialisation of children and the development of adult personalities. Unlike Murdoch, Parsons only outlines two key roles the family plays in society. 
Number one, primary socialisation. Parsons argues that the family is the primary agency of socialisation for children, as it is the first and most important social institution that children encounter. The family is responsible for teaching children the values, norms and beliefs of their society, as well as basic skills and behaviours necessary for functioning in society. Secondly, stabilisation of adult personalities. Parsons also emphasises the importance of the family in the stabilisation of adult personalities. He argues that the family plays a crucial role in the emotional and psychological development of individuals by providing a sense of security and emotional support. Parsons calls this the warm bath theory. As when someone comes home from a busy day of work, their family provides them with stress relief and relaxation, just as a warm bath would. In addition, he argues that the family is responsible for instilling in individuals a sense of personal responsibility, self-discipline and self-control, which are necessary for functioning as a responsible adult in society. Parsons' functionalist perspective emphasises that the family is an essential institution for maintaining social order and stability. He argues that the family performs important functions such as reproducing and raising children, providing for the economic well-being of its members and regulating sexual behaviour. Furthermore, he believes that the traditional nuclear family structure consisting of a married couple and their children, is the most efficient and effective way to meet these needs. An example of Parsons' perspective in action would be a traditional nuclear family where the father is the primary breadwinner and the mother is responsible for raising the children and maintaining the household. This family structure would be seen as functional as it would meet the basic needs of society and provide the necessary socialisation and emotional support for the children to grow up into responsible adults. Lesson 2. Sociological Perspectives on the Functions of Families. Marxists. The Marxist perspective has a very different view on the role of the family in society. Marxists emphasise the role of families in maintaining class inequality and reproducing the labour force for capitalist societies. According to Marxists, the family is an instrument of social control that serves the interests of the ruling class, known as the bourgeoisie by Marxists. They argue that the family functions to reproduce the labour force by socialising children into the values and beliefs necessary for capitalist society. For example, a Marxist would argue that family roles are structured to ensure that men are socialised for roles in the public sphere, such as paid work, while women are socialised for roles in the private sphere, such as unpaid domestic and care work. A prominent Marxist theorist in this field is Zaretsky. Zaretsky argued the family maintains capitalism in four ways. Firstly, inheritance. Private property and wealth is built up over time and passed down generation to generation through inheritance. This keeps wealth within ruling class families and it is not shared with working class families. Secondly, consumerism. Families buy and consume products of the capitalist system, e.g. food, clothes, holidays. This enables the bourgeoisie to make their profits. Thirdly, socialisation. The family socialise us into the norms and values of our class. For example, we may go into the same job as our parents. Working class children are socialised by the family to accept their subordinate role in society and see the system as fair. Fourthly, the role of women. 
Women in the family support capitalism in two ways. Firstly, they complete unpaid domestic labour, such as cooking and cleaning, which means men can focus on going to work and making profits for the bourgeoisie. Secondly, they act as an emotional cushion for men. Men may feel frustrated at work as they are underpaid and have no power. Women provide them with emotional support when they feel this way. This benefits capitalism as it reduces the stress men feel due to their exploitation in the workplace so they can continue to go to work. Lesson 3. Sociological Perspectives on the Functions of Families. Feminists. The final sociological perspective that considers the role of the family is feminism. The feminist perspective on families critiques the functionalist perspective for its emphasis on the traditional nuclear family structure and its failure to consider the ways in which families can be oppressive to women. Feminists argue that the traditional nuclear family structure is patriarchal and reinforces gender inequality by placing men as the primary breadwinners and women as primary caretakers. They also argue that the family can be a site of oppression for women, as they are often expected to prioritise the needs of their families over their own needs and desires. For example, a feminist might argue that the traditional gender roles within the family are limiting for women's autonomy and opportunities for economic and personal development. Prominent feminist theorists in this field are Dalphy and Leonard. They argue that the traditional nuclear family is not a natural or neutral institution, but it is a product of patriarchal societies, which serves to maintain male dominance and control over women. They also argue that the family is a site of exploitation and oppression for women who are expected to perform unpaid domestic labour and caregiving work. They also argue that the family is a key institution in maintaining the patriarchal structure of society by reproducing gender roles and maintaining the sexual division of labour. Lesson four, family forms. There are a variety of forms of family, including Number one, the nuclear family. This is the traditional family form consisting of a married couple and their biological or adopted children. The nuclear family is considered the basic unit of social organisation and is characterised by its relatively small size and close emotional bonds. Number two, the extended family. This is a family form that includes multiple generations living under the same roof or in close proximity to one another. In addition to parents and children, extended families may include grandparents, aunts, uncles and cousins. This type of family is common in many cultures, particularly in non-Western societies where multiple generations often live together and share resources. Number three, reconstituted family. This family form refers to a blended family where one or both partners have children from a previous relationship and they come together to form a new family unit. Reconstituted families may include step-parents, step-siblings and half-siblings. Number four, lone parent family. This family form is headed by a single parent who raises the children alone. This type of family is becoming more common in modern societies and may be the result of divorce, separation, or never being married. Number five, single sex family. This family form refers to a family where all members are of the same sex, such as a family headed by two mothers or two fathers. This type of family is becoming more common with the acceptance of same-sex relationships and the availability of assisted reproductive technologies.
Number six, beanpole family. This family form refers to a family that has multiple generations of older people and only some children in any generation that are all alive. Number seven, cohabitation. This refers to couples who live together but are not legally married. It has become more common in many societies, including the UK. It is often seen as a trial marriage where couples can test their compatibility. Some couples cohabit indefinitely without any intention of marrying. Number eight, empty nest. A family structure where all the children have left home, leaving the parents living on their own. This often occurs when children grow up and move out to study or work or start their own families. Number nine, empty shell. This refers to a relationship in which the couple continues to live together but with no real love or emotional connection between them. Couples may stay together due to social pressures, financial reasons, or for the sake of the children. These relationships might be free of open conflict, but can also be devoid of affection or intimacy. Number 10, kinship. The bond based on blood relations or marriage which ties individuals together in a family. This can extend beyond immediate family to include extended family, such as uncles, aunts, cousins, etc. There are also alternatives to families, such as, firstly, friends. It can be argued families are less important in our lives and are replaced by friends who provide emotional support. In this way, our friends are more important than our kin. Secondly, communal living. This is a group of people living together and sharing possessions and property. They have a shared responsibility for all members. A good example is the kibbutz communes, which were originally Jewish. Children slept in children's quarters and were collectively looked after by adults. And then they all ate together in one room. Thirdly, house share. A house share is when people live together but do not share possessions or property. For example, students living together or lodgers rent in a room. Number four. Residential homes. Elderly people and those with disabilities who struggle to care for themselves may live in a residential home where they have their own room but share the community life with other residents. Family diversity in modern societies, including the UK, has seen a significant increase due to various factors. Secularisation. Secularisation refers to the declining influence of religion in everyday life. Traditional religious beliefs often support the conventional nuclear family and may oppose divorce, cohabitation or same-sex relationships. As the influence of religion has decreased, there's been an increase in diverse family forms which might not align with traditional religious teachings. The change in position of women. Over the past century, women's rights and their roles in society have transformed drastically. With more women in the workforce and having their own careers, there's less economic dependency on men. This allows women more freedom in choosing their living arrangements and relationships. As women pursue higher education and careers, many are choosing to marry and have children later in life. Changes to legislation. Laws have evolved to recognise and support a broader range of family types, e.g. divorce, same-sex relationships and adoption and surrogacy. Changes to social attitudes. Societal views on what constitutes a normal or acceptable family have evolved. 
and changes to employment. The nature of work and employment has transformed over time, especially with the rise of flexible working patterns and remote work. Economic pressures, such as the need for dual incomes, have influenced family structures and roles. Lesson five, family forms in the UK compared to other countries. Here are a few examples of how family forms differ between the UK and other countries. Number one, extended family. Most families in the UK live in separate households. However, in some countries, it's more common for families to live in co-residential arrangements. For example, in many African and Asian cultures, it is not uncommon for multiple generations to live together in one household. This extended family structure may include grandparents, uncles, aunts and cousins, all living together and sharing resources and responsibilities. In India, joint families are still a common family form, where several generations of a family live together under one roof, often with the eldest male member being the head of the household. This family structure allows for shared resources and responsibilities, as well as a strong sense of community and support. Number two, communes. As previously stated, most families in the UK live in separate households. However, in some cultures, people live together in large groups known as communes. Communes were really popular in the USA in the 60s and 70s. They may have been based upon shared political beliefs or values, e.g. environmental issues. Number three, gender roles. Different cultures have different gender roles. For example, previously in the UK, families had more traditional gender roles, which meant men were often the breadwinner and went to work and women stayed at home as housewives. Arguably, this is changing over time as women are now engaged in the workforce. In the Caribbean, either sex can be head of the household. Number four, same-sex families. Same-sex families are becoming more visible and accepted in the UK, with an increasing number of same-sex couples raising children. However, in many other parts of the world, same-sex relationships and families are not recognised or are actively discriminated against. For example, in many countries in Africa and the Middle East, same-sex relationships are illegal and punishable by imprisonment or even death. Number five, single parent families. Single parent families are becoming increasingly common in the UK, but still represent a smaller proportion of families compared to many other countries. In the United States, for example, about 25% of families are headed by a single parent. In some countries, Single parent families are often the norm due to high rates of disease and other factors that result in the loss of a parent. Number six, kibbutzism. The kibbutz movement was built on principles of egalitarianism, communal living and collective ownership. Every member of the community would contribute to the work and in return, all their basic needs would be taken care of by the kibbutz. There's no private property, everything is owned by the community. Work is distributed among members based on the needs of the community and often rotates. In traditional kibbutzism, children were often raised in communal children's houses rather than by their biological parents. This was to ensure that upbringing was in line with community values and to free up parents to contribute to the kibbutz's work. However, this practice has changed in many kibbutzism over the years. Number seven, one child family. Instituted in 1979 by the Chinese government, the one child policy was a population control measure aimed at reducing the rapid growth rate of China's population. Families that adhered to the policy 
often receive benefits, such as better housing or educational opportunities. In contrast, those who violated the policy face penalties, which could include fines, loss of employment, or forced sterilisations and abortions. As the birth rate dropped and life expectancy increased, China began to experience an ageing population with a high proportion of elderly people. This demographic shift posed challenges for social support systems. By 2016, in response to the socio-economic challenges created by the one-child policy and a desire to balance the population's age structure, the Chinese government announced an end to the policy. Lesson 6. Family Diversity Statistics show the nuclear family is still the most popular type in the UK, but over time more types of family have emerged, making the nuclear family less important. The Rappaports were the first sociologists to identify this change, and like functionalists they saw this as a positive thing. They argued that family diversity is a natural and healthy aspect of society and that it should be celebrated and accepted rather than stigmatised or pathologised. They saw a postmodern future where people would have more freedom and choice over who is their family. They also argued that family diversity is not just a product of individual choices but is also shaped by social, economic and political factors. They identified five different types of family diversity. Organisational diversity. There is diversity between families as the decline of marriage and increase in divorce has led to new family types emerging e.g. lone parent and reconstituted families. There is also diversity within families as different patterns of work had left to differences in families. For example, dual career, stay at home and sharing of segregated conjugal roles. Cultural diversity. Migration to the UK means different cultures, ethnicities and religious beliefs add to the diversity of family life. Some have different types of marriage, e.g. polygamy, which is where more than one husband or wife at a time. And it also leads to different family practices, e.g. child rearing practices. Social class diversity. Family social class can affect the resources available to them and their values and behaviours. For example, working class tend to have shared domestic tasks if both parents work, whereas middle may have more segregated to support the husband's career. Life cycle diversity. You have different family structures as you move through life. For example, newly wedded couples may have no dependent children, but later have dependent children. As they get older, they may retire and may be in an empty nest family. Eventually, one may pass away, leading to a one-person household. Cohort diversity. Family structure can change depending on events and attitudes in the world. For example, the First World War created lots of lone parent families. Different laws and social attitudes have also led to less people getting married. Lockdown may have led to more divorces. Lesson 7. Conjugal roles. The domestic division of labour refers to the way in which domestic tasks and responsibilities are divided within a family. In traditional families, the domestic division of labour is typically characterised by a clear segregation of responsibilities between men and women. Men are typically seen as the primary breadwinners and are responsible for providing for the family financially, while women are responsible for managing the household, 
and caring for the children. This means that women are often responsible for tasks such as cooking, cleaning, laundry and childcare, while men are responsible for tasks such as home repairs and garden work. In contemporary families, the domestic division of labour is becoming more equal, with both partners sharing responsibilities more equally. This is due to several factors, including changes in gender roles and the increase in participation of women in the workforce. As a result, both partners are more likely to be working outside of the home, and both partners are more likely to be involved in domestic tasks and childcare. Functionalists would argue that domestic division of labour is important for the stability of the family unit and that it is best for the traditional gender roles to be maintained to meet the needs of the family and society. Feminists would argue that traditional domestic division of labour is a form of gender oppression and reinforces patriarchal power structures and that it limits women's opportunities and reinforces gender stereotypes. Marxists would argue that domestic division of labour is the result of power struggles within the family and that it is used to maintain class and power differentials. Conjugal roles are characteristics and duties taken on by individuals in a marriage. These can be joint or segregated. Joint conjugal roles refer to a situation where both partners in a conjugal relationship share domestic and economic responsibilities equally. This means that both partners contribute to the running of the household as well as participating in paid work outside of the home. In this type of conjugal role, partners also tend to share decision-making power and work together to achieve common goals. Segregated conjugal roles, on the other hand, refer to a situation where partners have distinct and separate domestic and economic responsibilities. In a segregated conjugal role, one partner typically takes on the role of primary breadwinner and is responsible for the majority of the paid work outside of the home, while the other partner takes on the role of primary caretaker and is responsible for the majority of the domestic work and childcare. In this type of conjugal role, Decision-making power is also typically concentrated in one partner. Different sociological perspectives have different views of the roles and relationships within conjugal relationships, also known as marriage or partnerships. The functionalist perspective. According to functionalists, the conjugal relationship plays a key role in maintaining social order and stability. The traditional gender roles within the conjugal relationship are seen as complementary, with the husband fulfilling the role of breadwinner, also known as the instrumental role, and the wife fulfilling the role of homemaker and caregiver, also known as the expressive role. They believe that traditional gender roles with men as the primary breadwinners and women as the primary caregivers are necessary for the stability and prosperity of families and society. They argue that these roles are based on biological differences and that men and women are naturally suited to different tasks. In this way, segregated conjugal roles based upon traditional gender roles are best suited to meet the needs of the family and society. They would argue that the segregation of conjugal roles is natural and efficient. The feminist perspective. Feminists critique the traditional gender roles within conjugal relationships as being patriarchal and oppressive to women. They argue that these traditional roles perpetuate gender inequality and are based upon patriarchal values and power relations. They believe that these roles are socially constructed and that men and women can perform the same tasks. They call for a more equal distribution of domestic and economic responsibilities within the conjugal relationship. 
the Marxist perspective. Marxists also believe that traditional gender roles are a result of social constructs and that they serve to maintain class distinctions and the capitalist system. They argue that the traditional family structure, with men as the primary breadwinners and women as the primary caregivers, serves to reproduce the labour force and maintain the capitalist system. Women have unequal roles in the family and complete most of the domestic tasks, as doing so supports capitalism. For example, by completing all the domestic work, it frees men up to go out and complete paid work. They see this as evidence of capitalism rather than patriarchy. Marxists would argue that the segregation of conjugal roles is a result of power imbalances and class inequalities, and that these roles are used to maintain social and economic power differentials. The postmodern perspective. Postmodernists reject the idea of a fixed and stable conjugal relationship and view it as a fluid, ever-changing construct. They argue that individuals have multiple identities and roles, and that these identities and roles are constantly changing and shifting. Lesson 8. The Symmetrical Family Wilmot and Young were sociologists who developed the theory of the symmetrical family in the 1970s. They argued that families in industrial societies have become increasingly symmetrical over time, meaning that both men and women have more equal roles in terms of domestic labour and childcare. This idea was in contrast to the traditional functionalist view of the family, which saw men as the breadwinners and women as the homemakers. The theory of the symmetrical family is based on the idea that as industrial societies become more complex, the division of labour within families becomes more complex as well. Wilmot and Young argue that as women enter the workforce in increasing numbers, traditional gender roles within the family begin to break down. This leads to both men and women sharing domestic and child rearing responsibilities more equally. Wilmot and Young also developed the principle of stratified diffusion, which states that changes in family patterns and gender roles tend to spread from the upper and middle classes to the working classes over time. They observed that changes in family patterns, such as the rise of the nuclear family and the decline of extended families, tend to occur first among the middle and upper classes and then spread to the working classes over time. Anne Oakley is a feminist sociologist who has written extensively on the idea of the conventional family and the role of women within it. Oakley's perspective is that the traditional nuclear family is a patriarchal institution that is harmful to women. According to Oakley, the traditional family is based on a model of domesticity where women are expected to fulfil the role of homemaker and caretaker, while men are expected to be the breadwinners. Oakley argues that this model of domesticity is harmful to women because it limits their opportunities for education, employment and personal development. She also argues that the domestic model of the family reinforces traditional gender roles and reinforces patriarchal power structures. Oakley also argues that the conventional family is a source of patriarchal oppression and that this oppressive nature of the traditional family structure is a cause of many of the problems that women face in society. Oakley does recognise that women are now more likely to be in paid work, but... She argues that instead of roles becoming more symmetrical as women enter the workforce, women in paid work still do the majority of the domestic labour. This means that they have the dual burden of both paid employment and domestic tasks, and in effect have two jobs. 
Oakley's perspective is not just a criticism of the traditional family form, but also a call for the creation of alternative forms of family and domestic arrangements that are more equitable and empowering for women. Oakley's perspective is that the traditional family is not a natural or neutral institution, but rather a social construct that has been shaped by patriarchal values and power relations. This means that it is not only possible, but also necessary to change the traditional family structure to create a more equal and just society for women. Lesson nine, factors that impact conjugal roles. Conjugal role relationships within the contemporary family can be impacted by a number of issues. Decision-making is an important aspect of conjugal role relationships. In traditional families, decision-making is typically seen as the responsibility of the male partner, while the female partner is responsible for managing the household and caring for the children. However, in contemporary families, decision-making is becoming more equal, with both partners sharing responsibilities more equally. This can lead to conflicts and disagreements if partners have different opinions or approaches to decision making. Money management is also an important aspect of conjugal role relationships. In traditional families, the male partner is typically seen as the primary breadwinner and is responsible for providing for the family financially. However, in contemporary families, both partners are more likely to be working outside of the home and both partners are more likely to be involved in money management. This can lead to conflicts and disagreements if partners have different approaches to managing finances or if one partner feels that they are contributing more financially than the other. Dual career families are becoming more common in the contemporary family, with both partners working outside of the home. This can lead to challenges in balancing work and family responsibilities, as well as conflicts over who will take care of the children and manage the household. Child rearing is also an important aspect of conjugal role relationships. In traditional families, the female partner is typically seen as the primary caregiver and is responsible for raising the children. However, in contemporary families, both partners are more likely to be involved in child rearing and this can lead to disagreements over parenting styles and decisions. Leisure activities are an important aspect of conjugal role relationships. In traditional families, Leisure activities are typically seen as a responsibility of the male partner, while the female partner is responsible for managing the household and caring for the children. However, in contemporary families, leisure activities are becoming more equal, with both partners sharing responsibilities more equally. This can lead to conflicts if partners have different interests or approaches to leisure activities. Lesson 10. How relationships in families have changed over time. Relationships within families have changed over time, reflecting the social and economic changes that have occurred throughout history. We can split this into three distinct family types over history. Pre-industrial, industrialised and contemporary. Let's look at pre-industrial families. These were typically large extended families that lived and worked together on farms or in small communities. The family worked as a unit together. Gender roles were shared as men, women and children worked according to their capabilities to provide for the family. Children were viewed as mini adults who were able to work and provide for the family as soon as they were physically capable. The family unit was responsible for the healthcare, education, 
and welfare of its members. Families were also closely tied to their communities, with extended family members and community members often working together and providing mutual support. Social mobility was rare, and you tended to stay in the social class you were born into. Industrialised families During the Industrial Revolution, families began to change as people moved from rural areas to cities for work. The nuclear family was now the dominant type. Gender roles changed as women became increasingly excluded from employment by legislation. Men became the breadwinner and women and children became dependents. The housewife role became prominent and women were responsible for the socialisation of children and emotional and physical care of the family. Children were seen as more vulnerable and were not allowed to work as the education system emerged. The state started to take over some functions of the family. For example, the NHS took over healthcare provision. At this point, families were able to achieve social mobility if the father got a well-paid job, although this was still difficult to achieve. And finally, moving on to contemporary families. In contemporary or modern societies, the concept of the nuclear family has become less prevalent as single parent and blended families have become more common. Gender roles within families have become more equal as women have entered the workforce in increasing numbers and men have become more involved in domestic and child rearing tasks. Additionally, there has been a rise in the acceptance of non-traditional family structures, such as same-sex relationships and single-parent families. Families have become more child-centred, seeing children as vulnerable and dependent. There are now lots of laws to protect children. More opportunities in the workplace means social mobility has become easier to achieve. Sociological perspectives on changing relationships within families can be broadly grouped into three main categories, functionalist, feminist and Marxist. The functionalist perspective. Functionalists see childhood as improving as a result of greater child-centeredness in the family. This has led children to be happier, safer and more valued. Compared to the pre-industrial family, where children were viewed as a unit of production to work, they are now objects of consumption, meaning they bring parents pleasure, pride, and they want to invest time and resources in them. Laws has also been created to protect children from abuse and neglect in the family. The feminist perspective. Feminists argue that the family is still a site of oppression for women, who are expected to take on most of the domestic labour and child-rearing responsibilities. Childhood is a time where girls are socialised to accept their secondary and subordinate position in society. Girls learn their future roles by observing the exploitation of their mothers within the patriarchal family. As society changes, feminists argue that the family should change as well, to promote gender equality and greater autonomy for women. The Marxist perspective. Marxists argue that the family reflects the larger capitalist society and that changes in the family are a result of changes in the economy and class relations. As capitalist societies undergo changes, such as the rise of the service sector and the decline of the industrial sector, the family also changes with new forms of family emerging, such as the dual earner family. Children also suffer due to the capitalist society, for example, by poverty, neglect and abuse. Since the system is driven by profit, children inevitably become casualties of low wages, alienated workers and frustrated parents with financial worries and debt. All three perspectives highlight different aspects of how relationships within families change over time, 
and how these changes are connected to broader social and economic changes. Lesson 11. Contemporary family related issues. Contemporary family related issues include Number one, the responsibility of parents. As time has passed, children are viewed as increasingly vulnerable. This has meant children have become more dependent on adults. The period of dependency is increasing, as children are now expected to remain in education until they are 18. Number two, the quality of parenting. There is ongoing debate about what constitutes good parenting and how to measure it. Some argue that permissive parenting styles can lead to children who lack self-discipline, while others argue that authoritarian parenting styles can lead to children who lack self-esteem. Some argue the role of the parent is diminishing and being replaced by peers, teachers, the internet and games. Tablets and TV are known as electronic babysitters. Increased access to technology means parents have less control over the behaviour of their children. Teenagers also have far more access to unsuitable and harmful materials online. Others disagree and say parents have too much control over their children. For example, parents control children's resources like their pocket money, their space, have in adult only areas, their time, what bedtime and curfews they have, and their bodies, including the dinner and clothes they wear. Number three, relationships between teenagers and adults. The relationship between teenagers and adults can be fraught with conflict. Adolescents often struggle to gain independence and assert their own identity while adults may struggle to let go of control and accept their child's growing autonomy. Furthermore, some studies have suggested that parental involvement and monitoring can have negative effects on adolescent mental health and well-being. Number four, care of the disabled and elderly. The care of disabled and elderly family members is an ongoing issue for many families. This can include providing financial support, emotional support and physical care. As the population ages, the number of people with disabilities and elderly individuals is expected to increase, putting a strain on families and healthcare systems. Number five, arranged marriage. Arranged marriages are still practiced in some cultures and traditions, where parents or a third party arrange the marriage between two individuals. While some argue that arranged marriages can lead to stable and fulfilling relationships, others argue that they can limit personal freedom and lead to feelings of pressure and dissatisfaction. All these issues reflect the complexity and diversity of contemporary families. The way family members interact and the way they are expected to interact is different in different cultures and societies. Furthermore, the roles and responsibilities within families are also changing over time as gender roles and social norms evolve. Lesson 12. Criticisms of families. Number one. Isolation and unrealistic idealisation. Some family members can have unrealistic and idealised expectations of relationships and others in the family. For example, a child may feel parents have unrealistic expectations of their academic performance. This can be made worse by society's expectations of us and social media. The pressure of these unrealistic expectations can lead to disappointment and have a negative impact on mental health. They argue that the emphasis on the nuclear family as the ideal unit can lead to neglect of other forms of family and community support. Number two, loss of traditional functions. 
Critics argue that the traditional functions of the family, such as providing economic support and socialisation, have been taken over by other institutions, leaving families with less purpose and fewer responsibilities. For example, education is now performed by school, healthcare is now performed by the NHS, and welfare is now looked after by social services. This reduced the importance of the family. Number three, lack of contact with wider kinship networks. As we have become more geographically mobile, those moving away may lose touch with their elderly relatives who are unable to travel. As there has been more focus on the immediate nuclear family, we have less contact with extended family, which may contribute to isolation, particularly those who are divorced or widowed. Number four, the status and role of women within families. Critics argue that traditional gender roles within families can be oppressive to women, who are often expected to take on the majority of domestic and caregiving responsibilities. Number five, marital breakdown. Around one in three marriages end in divorce. Critics argue that the high rates of marital breakdown in contemporary society can have negative effects on children and families, leading to increased poverty and mental health problems. Number six, dysfunctional families. Critics argue that some families may be dysfunctional, characterised by neglect, abuse and domestic violence which can have a detrimental impact on the physical, mental and emotional well-being of family members. Different sociological perspectives criticise the family for different reasons. Functionalists generally see the family as positive and supportive. However, some functionalists recognise negative aspects of the family. They suggest children become emotional scapegoats for parents as they offload their daily stresses onto them. Marxists, such as Zaretsky, argue the family is unable to provide for the psychological and social needs of the individual. Instead, it exists to support capitalism and in doing so can have a negative impact on individuals. Feminists such as Delphi and Leonard argue the positive view of the family hides the true amount of unhappiness and frustration experienced by women in the family. They believe the family has a central role in upholding patriarchy and see the family as a vehicle for female oppression and subjugation. Women are twice as likely as men to experience domestic abuse. Lesson 13 the change in patterns of divorce. The pattern of divorce in Britain since 1945 has seen a steady increase in the overall divorce rate. In 1945, the divorce rate in England and Wales was around 9 per 100,000 population. By 1964, it had risen to 18 per 100,000 population. The divorce rate continued to rise throughout the latter half of the 20th century, reaching a peak of about 16 per 1,000 married population in 1993. In the 21st century, the divorce rate in England and Wales has fluctuated around 11.5 per 1,000 married population, but it is still much higher than it was in the mid 20th century. According to the Office of National Statistics, There were 101,669 divorces granted in England and Wales in 2020. The main factors that have contributed to the increase in the divorce rate in Britain since 1945 include changes in social attitudes towards marriage and divorce, the increase in number of women in the workforce and the availability of no-fault divorce. Additionally, the increase in cohabitation as an alternative to marriage has led to a decline in the number of marriages, which in turn has led to a decline in the number of potential divorce cases. In 2020, the average length of marriage for divorce was 12.7 years, 
with the majority of marriages ending in divorce within the first 10 years. And the rate of divorce is higher for those who marry at a younger age. There are several reasons that have contributed to the rise in divorce in Britain since 1945. Changes in the law. One of the main reasons for the rise in divorce has been changes in the law. Prior to 1969, divorce in Britain was only possible by proving that one spouse was at fault, such as through adultery or cruelty. However, the Divorce Reform Act of 1969 introduced the concept of no-fault divorce making it possible for couples to divorce simply by stating that the marriage had broke down irretrievably. This made it easier for couples to obtain a divorce and led to a significant increase in the number of divorce cases. Changing social attitudes. Another reason for the rise in divorce has been changes in social attitudes and values. As society has become more secular, Traditional values and beliefs about marriage and the family have been challenged. The idea of marriage as a lifelong commitment has been replaced by a more individualistic approach, with people feeling more entitled to seek happiness and fulfilment in their personal lives. This has led to a decline in the number of marriages and an increase in the number of divorces. The change in status of women. The status of women in society has also played a role in the rise in divorce. As women have become more financially independent and have gained greater access to education and employment opportunities, they have been less willing to tolerate unhappy or unsatisfying marriages. This has led to an increase in the number of women initiating divorce proceedings. Secularisation Secularisation has also played a role, as with the rise of secularisation, traditional values and beliefs about marriage and the family have been challenged. This has led to a decline in the number of marriages and an increase in the number of divorces, as people have become more individualistic. Increased life expectancy. As we now live longer, we are more likely to seek a new partner in later life if we are unhappy with our current ones. Previously, we felt more of a need to stick with our partners, even if we were unhappy, as we felt we didn't have enough of our lives left to make a big change. Now, many people divorce midlife and find new partners. Sociological perspectives on divorce and the rise in lone parent families can offer different explanations and understandings of these issues. Functionalists would argue that divorce is a negative consequence of the breakdown of social institutions such as the family. They would argue that the family is a vital institution that fulfills several important functions, including socialisation, emotional support and the care of children. Thus, they would argue that the rise in divorce and lone parent families is a sign that society is not functioning properly. However, they do recognise some positive functions of divorce. For example, it can lead to less dysfunctional families. Feminist sociologists would argue that the rise in divorce and lone parent families is a result of patriarchal social structures that have oppressed women and limited their opportunities. They would argue that the traditional nuclear family is a patriarchal institution that has been used to control and exploit women. They would also argue that the rise in lone parent families is a result of the lack of support for women who are trying to raise children on their own. Feminists believe the family is often a less happy place for women than men, causing them to feel resentment, for example, because of triple shift and domestic abuse. Previously, women could not apply for divorce and were often forced to stay in unhappy marriages. Consequently, feminists often see divorce as a positive thing, so women can escape unhappy marriages. Marxist sociologists would argue that the rise in divorce and lone parent families is a result of the capitalist economic system. 
they would argue that the capitalist system creates a society that is characterised by economic inequality and class conflict, which can lead to the breakdown of families. They would also argue that the rise in lone parent families is a result of the capitalist system's failure to provide adequate support for working class families. Lesson 14. The Consequences of Divorce Divorces can have several negative consequences for family members, including emotional, financial and social effects. For the husband and wife, divorce can be a traumatic and stressful experience. It can lead to feelings of grief, loss and emotional turmoil, as well as financial stress and uncertainty. The couple may experience a loss of companionship and emotional support, as well as difficulties in co-parenting and maintaining a relationship with their children. For children, divorce can be particularly difficult as it can disrupt their sense of security and stability. Children may experience feelings of abandonment and loss, as well as difficulty adjusting to living in two separate households. They may also struggle with the emotional turmoil of their parents and have difficulty coping with changes in their family dynamics. Children of divorced parents are also more likely to experience behavioural and emotional problems and have a greater risk of academic and social problems. For extended family members, divorce can also be a difficult and stressful experience. They may be called upon to provide emotional and financial support to the couple and their children, which can be very challenging. They may also experience a sense of loss and sadness as the family unit is disrupted. The increase in the number of lone parent families is also a consequence of the rise in divorce. Lone parent families are more likely to experience financial difficulties and are more likely to live in poverty than two parent families. They may also struggle with the responsibilities of raising children on their own and may experience feelings of isolation and loneliness. Ouch! This is why in some videos I like explain scratches. <laughs>